Hello and welcome to another eerie episode of Saved by the 90s. My name is Adam Patterson. With me today is a guy who would never leave Jersey for Indiana, Ken Bakley. Hey, Ken. Hello. The funny thing was I wrote that before we had a just a brief conversation before the show where you might be leaving Jersey. So Yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. Not for whoa. Indiana, though. No. Uh, no. Uh, well... When I uh, when I was younger, apparently my my dad uh, tells the story. I was too young to remember this. Where uh, he was considering a move from the company he was working for at the time that would have taken our family to somewhere in rural Indiana. And whoa! Uh, <laughs> so I did think about that while watching the show, and um, it didn't happen. And I'm uh, uh, no offense to any Indianans listening, but I I don't I don't feel. <laughs> too terribly badly about that because yeah. it wasn't like it was it was a pretty my understanding a pretty remote place in general and i just don't i don't thrive in in rural settings i think <laughs> i do more now than i used to mm. i used to i mean many of you know I, I lived in new york city for five years or so and mm. i loved it I, I i still miss it but I do kind of like the slower paced mm. lifestyle now. Yeah. I that isn't to say that I couldn't like immediately get back into living in the city. Like mm-hmm. I could I could definitely get back into it, but anyway, anyway, uh if you couldn't already tell, we're going to be doing something a little bit different this month and we're going to be taking a deep dive into a TV show and that TV show is indeed Eerie Indiana. So we're going to do a full retrospective on the entire show. We're going to break this up into two episodes. So this month, we're going to talk about the first half of the show. Next month, we're going to talk about the second half. We might actually get into at least briefly mentioning the uh, the second series of Erie, Indiana that came out, which... I uh, didn't even know about until <laughs> that was <laughs> researching the yeah. show. Yeah, like the thing is, I loved this show as a kid. I was like obsessed with this show as a kid, and I had no idea. And and apparently, the the second series uh, kicked off like right around the time when this one like was over. Like it pretty much picked up right after this one. So. Just to give you some backstory, if you're if you're not familiar with the show, it was uh, created by Jose Rivera and Carl Schaefer. Uh, Joe Dante was a creative consultant on this, and it originally aired on NBC on uh, let's see September fifteenth, nineteen ninety one to April twelfth, nineteen ninety two, and it was and my research friend in a Sunday night. It was, yes, which is interesting. It was on Sunday nights at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. So I, I don't that's know. A very, <laughs> it's a very weird time. I don't know when I thought the right time for Erie, Indiana to be on was, but I don't think I would have guessed Sunday nights at 7.30. I didn't know that for many years. I don't know. I think I was like looking up this show another time, like like years ago. To, and and I learned that it was originally like uh, an evening show um, then, but I know the show and probably most people from my generation know the show from being on the Fox kids block on Fox on Saturday mornings. So later it Fox kids picked it up and it aired. Uh, it was like one of the last shows. So like, it's like all cartoons in the morning, and then like at the very end, the tail end of the block, they do like some live action stuff, and that's I think like probably when like Power Rangers was on, but like this show was on at the end, and it was extremely popular on Fox, and that's why they um they continued it with that new series, which I gotta say like i i I haven't watched any any of the new one. Mm-hmm. Yet, but it looks so far <laughs> inferior to this one. Like it doesn't <laughs> even look like it's in the same caliber whatsoever as this one. So if you're not familiar uh, with kind of what the show is about, 
It's uh, it's about a, a 13 year old kid named Marshall Teller, and he moves to this place called Erie, Indiana, from New Jersey with his family, uh, his mom and his dad and his older sister. And he discovers that there's like some really weird stuff going on in this town. And the show is sort of just a, a it's basically like a kid's version of X-Files, sort of. Yeah. Uh, you, you have Marshall, who's played by Omri Katz, and he is joined by his best friend Simon, played by Justin Shrinkero. Shrinkero. And the two of them go on these, uh, or have these like crazy, sometimes supernatural things that happen. And it usually involves some kind of like weird neighbor or something like that. But the thing that you, that you notice right off the bat with this show is the, the production quality is much higher than something that you would typically see in a kid's show. Like, I mean, it's shot on film, which I understand lots of shows were back then, but for today, it's very unusual to see a TV show shot on film. Yeah. And just the overall quality uh, of like the, the acting, the writing, the directing, like everything on this show is of a much higher quality than something that really anything else you would see. The only thing that I would compare it to would be like Pete and Pete. Like I would say that Pete and Pete is up there in quality, but even I would say that this is even probably a higher quality than Pete and Pete, but I guess it makes sense considering it was originally developed for like a, like a prime time yeah, yeah. slot. Mm -hmm. So it probably had a little bit of a bigger budget maybe mm -hmm. than your typical I would have, I would have to kids guess. show. Mm -hmm. So Ken, what's your familiarity with the show? We're going to go through the first nine episodes or sorry, the first 10 first episodes. 10, yeah. Yeah, we're going to go through the first 10 episodes this month. But before we get into like the nitty gritty of each one, what's your overall familiarity with the show? Were you, uh, did, did, did you know what it was? Have you seen it before? I wasn't really familiar with it. I just knew it as one of those shows that uh, lots of people uh, remember and have uh very warm feelings towards and i remembered at some point in the past i don't know if it was on a podcast or uh offline you had mentioned that uh you had brought up the show a couple of times uh and so eventually i just thought i discovered that it was on you know free with ads on youtube and so i suggested let's talk about Erie, indiana uh because it's always i think uh interesting to kind of uh, break the usual format of the show uh and and talk about something a little bit different uh and um yeah uh, i i it was all from the outside for me uh uh going into this i really didn't have any familiarity with it okay and i was as i said a, a pretty huge fan as as a as a kid so uh, where does it so i think it aired on fox in like 1997 or some somewhere around there and it, that was just kind of like the right age for me mm -hmm. um, to be like really into this because as a kid, I was into like horror movies and sci-fi and monster movies and stuff like that. So this was just like perfect for me, really. Um, getting into, I guess what we can do is just, just go down, start with the first episode. Now we're going by the list on the youtube playlist which we discovered is not the actual air date um it uses the production date mm -hmm. instead so for the most part it's uh it matches the air date but there's like one if i'm not mistaken in there that's that's kind of thrown in that was actually the last episode to air and i think that that one um the weird thing about that one was that like it it aired much later. So I think like like the show got canceled, but they still had like one episode to to put out there. Mm. So they dropped it like the, sh the the last episode 
which was episode 18, aired on April 12th, 1992. But then the, the 19th episode didn't drop until December 9th, 1993. Yeah. So yeah, there was a huge <laughs> gap in there. It lo- looks like from what I'm saying, it it might have just been like it it just never aired on the network for whatever reason, and just was unceremoniously uh, thrown into the uh, syndication package. Yeah, I think because yeah. it went to so after it left NBC, it went to the Disney Channel, and I think that. Um, in 93 is when it went to the Disney channel. And that's when during that run is when the final episode aired. But interestingly, the, that final episode was actually the fifth to be shot. So the first episode is it's called forever where it's directed by Joe Dante. And one thing you'll notice is that Joe Dante directed uh, a number of Mm -hmm. these, but then you also have, like Bob Balaban. Bob Balaban, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bob Balaban coming in, directing a bunch of them. So there there was some, you know, there was some heft mm-hmm. behind the behind the camera here. And I think that that's that's really evident. And I think that you, that um even if you're not super familiar with the show as we're talking about it, I think that you'll quickly understand that this is not like your typical kids show. It's not like the the Goosebumps show or you know, even are you afraid of the dark? It's it's uh, definitely more mature than than something like that. So the show kicks off. I think it starts off pretty strong mm-hmm. with Foreverware. The premise of this episode is that, and they do a really cool thing too, where they 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 kind of set up the overarching story here. So a lot of this is like introducing Marshall and like him not being super happy about being in this like weird town and all that stuff. Um, But then you have the, the main story. And for, for the most part, these are all like self-contained stories. You have this, uh, it's basically like a Tupperware lady who's like one of their neighbors. And she is trying to sell Marshall's mom on this, on this like Tupperware stuff, which is called foreverware. And they, Marshall discovers that there's some kind of like, it's like a little bit culty. Mm-hmm. There's like something, there's something a little off about this whole situation. And then he discovers that, uh, after these really creepy twins that are the, the, the kids of this, this lady, they slip him a note and, uh, it says like yearbook 1964 or something. So he goes and looks up the yearbook and realizes that those kids are in the yearbook from 1964 and through some some snooping, he discovers that in the evening, the mom seals the kids <laughs> in this Tupperware, and it prevents them from aging. It it, it, and, it turns out you can get you can get foreverware in people sized containers. Yeah, so, I mean, we'll keep, uh, yeah, it's it's so her husband was the inventor of this foreverware. And first of all, like I props to the uh well, props to the props yeah, team for yeah. making yeah, this that's, giant that's the, these giant <laughs> containers. Yeah, that's the reason that I was thinking about just like the even the concept of a people size for everywhere because I thought that's just an amazing bit of prop work. <laughs> yeah, just... and, and it looks really good. Like it looks like legit like a legit Tupperware container. Yeah, it's like and I, I also yeah. I also like there's like little details that they did with it too where like the sons, the twins, like the mom seals them in so they can't get out. Like once they're sealed in, that they're in there. But the mom has like a handle on hers because she seals herself in too to prevent herself from aging. And so you can see on hers, there's like a little little handle that allows her to open her own container from the inside, mm-hmm. which I thought was like a nice little little touch. Mm-hmm. They they um they went a little nuts with the uh the dry ice in this, which <laughs> is something that they do multiple times. Mm-hmm. Uh, they go a little they go a little bonkers with the dry ice, but this seems like it was a it it was a dry ice heavy era. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> it well, definitely was. It uh, it most certainly was. But I think that this this episode does a good job of establishing 
just the the overall vibe of the show where it's a little bit lighthearted, but there's always something a little bit more serious happening beneath the surface. And I think that the themes of the show do kind of peek out in this, in this, um, this pilot. And, um, I think that it also just sets the groundwork for, for what's to come. And I I think it's a a really good episode to, to start the series off with. Yeah, it it definitely does well. And, uh, as you say, balancing that, I, I'm very, uh, uh, very sin- uh, sincerely good at b- show. Excuse me. It, as you say, it does a good job at balancing the humor to it because it is a uh, a show that takes great pleasure in just being ridiculous. But it's also a, just a show that's gently sinister <laughs> from top to bottom, uh, and I mean yeah, that it is. in a nice I mean- way. <laughs> Yeah, because, I mean, there's some creepy, like, first of all, the twins are kind of inherently creepy, like, they're designed to be weird, Um, but then you, when you, like, drill down a little bit and you think about how their mom is, like, keeping them in this, per- the, this um perpetual state of childhood, and they're unable to grow up, and every year they're, I think they said they're in, like, sixth grade or something, so they have to do sixth grade every year for, like, 30 years, and it's, like, that's, like, a whole other level of, uh, you know, helicopter parenting, I I think. And the the way that, the so the way that it ends, I don't know, I guess, I guess we'll I guess we can just talk about how these end. I don't know. I, I think this show carries a blanket spoiler warning in general. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The the way that it ends is, is I, I like the way that it ends as well, because you have, so, so, so basically the mom, Marshall's mom is like, she's a little bit brainwashed with the, with the forever where she's, she's stuff, intrigued but, by it. Yeah. She's not like completely sold on it, but at the same time, like she's a, she's a very messy person and she gets kind of wrapped up in the forever wear thing I, to, I, to, to become, you know, cleaner, neater, all that stuff. I, I do like the, the bit of business in, in both. I think, uh, uh, showing how the series approaches itself and from both the level of absurdity and the level of. Uh, cluing us into what uh, to what's going to follow is uh, she sold on Foreverware because uh, the, 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 uh, one of the the sales pitches is that you, they get a a Foreverware tub that has a seventeen year old bologna <laughs> yeah. sandwich in it that <laughs> looks completely fresh as long as it's sealed and they do some wonderful business throughout the episode with that and I appreciated it very much. <laughs> When they finally showed it, when because yeah. Marshall he he takes the lid off, he doesn't yeah. put it back right. No, so, so later on it, you see what happens. It, all seventeen of those years from nineteen seventy four to nineteen ninety one catch up with it all at once. <laughs> yeah. It, so what? Yeah. It's it, what happens is the the aging process is accelerated if you leave the the tub off the the top. So. Marshall and Simon rescue the twins and the next thing they know there's these like two 35 year old men hammering in a for sale sign in the house and it turns out that those are the the twins and the mom is seen in the window and she's like you know dust basically (laughs) So uh, uh, that you know, was a, a, like I said, it was a good way to to kick off the series, and I think it was a really, I think it's a really good episode. This is one. It's interesting. I remember most of these episodes, and this is like the one that I remember the most for some reason. Like this is the one that I can very easily remember, like every every little bit of it. Is it is it possible that you might have well uh, seen this one first? Probably. As well? Yeah, Yeah, probably. (laughs) Yeah, I've probably seen this one a bunch of times. They probably re-ran it a million times. Hmm. So that's episode one. Moving on to episode two, we have The Retainer. This is also written... uh, Sorry, this is also directed by Joe Dante. 
And this one is, I think when, when the show kind of starts to show its darker side and when it becomes apparent that this isn't just your, your regular old kid show, because there's two people that die in this mm-hmm. show. Yeah, in this episode, I mean, th- th- there's no death in the first episode, but there is, it is not trivial to future episodes. <laughs> Yeah, they and that's I think something that is like definitely a not something you see at all. I mean, even in like horror shows like Goosebumps and Are You Afraid of the Dark, I don't think it's rare that you see people just straight up get killed, especially when it comes to kids. And Mm -hmm. although they don't explicitly uh, say that this kid dies in this. I think it's safe to assume that this kid dies because they say they never see him again. And it's like, well, what could that mean? You never see the kid again. Yes. And, and then also the retainer shows up at the end. So, yeah. And it, and it is made direct in future episodes when, when children are dying. Yeah. And, and also there's a scene. So just to back up a little bit, the retainer, it's about this uh, neighbor kid who gets a this like giant retainer <laughs> from this like this like psychotic orthodontist guy this really creepy guy who's got these like experimental uh retainers and stuff and th- th- that's the other thing is like you'll you'll see that these like kind of these episodes are sort of sort of revolve around like normal kid stuff mm-hmm. that as an adult, you're just like, oh, whatever. But as a kid, you're, th- that is a horror show. Like mm-hmm. getting, a, I, I got a retainer when I was that age and it, I was horrified. Like I didn't want a retainer. That's a nightmare. Mm. So a lot of the episodes you'll find deal with that type of stuff where they, they draw inspiration from real, real stuff that happens to you as a kid and, and kind of twist it around a little bit to, to, make it into this kind of creepy story. So you have this neighbor kid gets a retainer and the retainer gives him the ability to hear dogs. So it like the metal in the retainer acts as sort of like a receiver is tuned to the frequency of dog language. So he can hear everything that dogs are saying and he uncovers this plot of like the dogs rising up and, and like just taking over and he, he gets killed. Like mm-hmm. the dogs eat him. Mm. The dogs just straight up murder him again. We don't see it happen, but we do see the dogs like attack him, like, like all ganging up on him. And then he's gone. What we do see is there's a scene when, um, they find out that the dogs are going to be breaking out all the other dogs that are in the pound. And so Marshall and Simon and this kid go to, to, I guess, see what's going on. And they literally find the dog catchers femur. Like they find his bones. Mm. So they, uh, the dogs definitely kill the dog catcher. Mm. It, I, I feel like it, it's also in the uh, incredibly rare position for a media aimed at children that the dog is dogs are bad. <laughs> yeah. And that's that is kind of a weird thing where, you know, usually if you're going to present an animal as bad, it's usually cats like mm-hmm. ca- cats are usually the, the mean, the bad, the ones that are like plotting against you. But yeah, dogs are not. They're kind of the villains in this. There's this, there's also a scene when a dog attacks Simon, mm-hmm. and yeah, it's uh, it's kind of interesting. Not not really uh, not really typical to to see that, but mm. the whole kind of the 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 beginning of this is that Marshall discovers that he needs to get a retainer, and he's like not wanting to go because he's worried that this is going to happen to him too. But he ends up getting just a regular old retainer that doesn't allow him to communicate with dogs. Hmm. So this is another really great episode too, I think. Yeah. I, I, I basically like all of these episodes so far. Yeah. I think 
Yeah, I think uh, just looking at all of them, I, I think they're all good. Like, I think it's a really great show. And I, there weren't any that, like, I mean, may, maybe there were some I liked more than others, but f- uh, there weren't any that I, like, actively disliked. So I think I think The Retainers up there is, like, one of my favorites. Uh, so the next one is called a- The ATM with the Heart of Gold. This was this fascinating direct- to me. Th- this one's directed by Sam Pillsbury. And this is this one's interesting because it involves like this AI that becomes sentient. And I, I just I feel like you don't you didn't see a whole lot of that type mm-hmm. of stuff. You obviously you did. Um, like, you know, two thousand one and all all of those types of um sci fi movies, but you just didn't you didn't see a ton of it in by nineteen ninety one. And uh, yeah, so the premise of this one is that uh, Marshall's dad works for this, like, I guess, tech company, and they d- he develops this ATM that is run by this kind of Max Headroom-looking AI, and Simon becomes friends with this this. Uh, program and it starts giving him money and all of a sudden Simon he starts getting friends and he becomes popular it's but it's all because of the money and it's um there's a couple aspects of this one that I think are really interesting beyond just the the basic uh AI type thing you find out that the money that Simon's getting is from other people's bank accounts and he takes, he gives Simon so much money that everyone in the town goes bankrupt, <laughs> which I think is kind of interesting. Which is interesting because he, he did not, because we, sh- it, it, I mean, the, the episode is about Simon spending a lot of money, but he did not spend that much money. So unless, yeah. <laughs> unless people in this town don't have any money, which it doesn't seem to be the case because it's just presented as this very kind of, Middle class, middle class yeah town or we missed the part where he buys like uh he just like buys a he bunch buys of houses <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he just buys yeah. an entire street of houses <laughs> uh yeah he has yeah. like so much money and mm-hmm. he does return it at the end but i think that one of the the kind of more interesting things that this sh- that this episode starts to explore is simon's home life and how he clearly does not have a good situation at home Mm -hmm. and it's it's not that he's just like he is poor but it's not just that it's that his parents seem to be in some sort of like divorce type thing where there's a scene when marshall is over there over at Simon's and you can hear um, a, a woman laughing and, and Marshall's like, Oh, your mom's really laughing at something, isn't she? And, and Simon says, my mom's not home. Hmm. And I feel like that scene is actually pretty powerful hmm. because it doesn't explicitly spell out what's happening, but it seems very clear that he's he's kind of going through some not great stuff with his parents it's it's a show that's definitely giving uh that character more than more to do and more to be than you would suspect a lot of shows kind of set up along the same lines would yeah, he's t- he's definitely more than a sidekick and I mean this episode I think is a good example of I mean it's only the third episode in the series and it's completely centered on him. And I think later on they do more with developing Simon as a character and his his kind of tumultuous home life and that that type of stuff. Um and, and but a lot of it is just like small hints like him wanting to stay over at Marshall's house for dinner and stuff like that. And it's like, 
There's just these small things that I bet most kids watching the show wouldn't even pick up on. Uh But I think a lot of adults who are watching it uh, can either relate to a lot of the situations that are presented in the show or, you know, can at least pick up on some of the, the subtle things that they include in some of these episodes. And there's more to it than, than just this one specifically that we'll probably get into. You, you you want you you feel bad i mean you want simon to have nice things you want you want a, you, you you understand but he can't have nice things because even when he gets nice things it turns out it's from a malicious atm that's bankrupting the entire town <laughs> yeah <laughs> simon oh, cannot really. catch a break no he can't poor poor simon he just wanted a friend with uh-huh. mr wilson see the whole thing was here that simon is only 10 and Marshall's 13 and Marshall is like the two of them became friends early on, but now Marshall is starting to try to hang out with kids his age. And you know, when you're, when you're that age, like every year is so drastic Mm -hmm. as far as like development. So like it makes sense that Marshall would want to hang out with, you know, these, these kids who are his age, like 13 years old. Because to to him, Mar- uh, Simon is still like a little like a little kid, you know, wanting to play with action figures and stuff. So Simon feels abandoned by both his best friend and likely his parents. Mm. So he, you know, becomes best friends with an ATM naturally. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> the ATM but it's also was funny there. because. It's also funny because there's a scene when Marshall's dad, again, he created this whole thing and he's like going through the reports and he's like, huh, he's like, there's only one person using Mr. Wilson, but he's using it a lot. And then like, there's another time when he's like going through and he's like, man, Mr. Wilson did $4 million in transactions. And it's like, I feel like you have too much information here, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. You're not the bank. <laughs> You're just a guy who created yeah. this like AI. Yeah, it, it's very uh, yeah. Well, first of all, just the idea that it, of course the the ATM would interact in a human context to 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 feel like it was emulating human connection, uh, which turned out to be very critical for how the episode ends up going. Uh, to 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 act as a friend. Uh, and secondly, yeah, that was uh, bizarre. That was very much like we need to introduce this exposition now so we can set up the. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. but also <laughs> the fact that he's like, OK, well, let's set aside the fact that like yeah. it's weird that he has all this information. One person, Simon mm-hmm. is literally the only person using the ATM <laughs> like as far as I can tell, it's the only bank in this town. So what are these people doing? They're just, they're going old school and like filling out a withdrawal slip and going into the bank. Is that, is that what we're led to believe? Yeah. Not a single other person is using this Mr. Wilson thing because they, they took one look at it and they're like, that is really creepy. And I don't want to be talking to some AI when I just want to get 20 (laughs) bucks out for lunch. Yeah. This is, uh, there's a lot of questions about the. Uh, I this feels like a bizarre thing to say. I am beginning to question the general uh, infrastructure of Erie, Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we know it's a weird place. We yeah. know that uh, thing like just logic doesn't really have a place in Erie, Indiana. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They do. They do say we we see that Elvis lives there. Mm-hmm. Sasquatch lives there. There's that weird lady with the uh, the straight jacket. And don't don't know what that's all about. And and Elvis is not just a a, a cameo in the uh, opening credits. No, yeah, he's, he's Elvis in there. features in the story. Yeah, he's he's in there. <laughs> the the straight jacket lady, you see her later too, mm. like in the background. And that, that's the other thing. Quickly, uh, if you pay attention, you see all kinds of weird stuff. Mm. Like background characters, they'll just give them like weird stuff to do. Like the, like the one episode, um, I, I think it was the, uh, uh, I think it was the, the letter, the one with Tobey Maguire, mm. uh, the, you, you see yeah, a person walking in the Maguire background with the, in the show. 
Yeah. You see somebody walking with a giant scythe in the background for like no reason. I, but uh, you were you were yeah, saying no. I did want to point out, um, you know, we I there are some interesting directors on this show, uh, Joe Dante and Bob Balaban, as we were saying. But I didn't, I wasn't familiar with Sam Pillsbury, so I looked him up, and I found out that he doesn't make films anymore. He's he's a winemaker now because I found when I googled him, one of the first things I found was an interview him interview with him on this uh uh wine website, and it I just feel like I need to need to add uh it was an email interview so the writer emailed these questions to him and he emailed them back his answers back in all caps and it was reproduced in all caps <laughs> so it's just you yes. know regular you know uh prose case or whatever the term is questions and then he just yelling all caps answers with like five exclamation points uh <laughs> and um that's what i know about sam Pillsbury. <laughs> Did they ask him about Erie, Indiana? I do not believe it. I, d- I did not look closely enough. I, I, you know, all the all caps and all the typing, it, it wore me out. I, I'd have to look at it again. <laughs> I, it's they like, probably did it. Even if, <laughs> even if I was interviewing him about wine, I couldn't not yeah. interview him about... The director about of two Erie, episodes Indiana. of Erie, Indiana here. Yeah, I just want to, I want to know more. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I mean, he did Free Willy Three, The Rescue, too. I mean, I guess you could ask him about yeah. that, but really, who cares about Free Willy Three? I'm I'm here to talk about Erie the Indiana, a, the AI ATM, and <laughs> yeah, I need to know more about this. So yeah, that's uh, episode three. That's another solid episode. Moving on to episode four, we have The Losers. This is also written. Uh, I keep saying written. This is also directed by Joe Dante. This one is, it's kind of interesting. I feel like that this is a little bit of a lesser one. It's, it's, it's a little, it's a good concept, but it doesn't really. Yeah, it's, it's a good concept. It's one of the more goofy ones that, that is pretty much just like a straight up kind of comedy. Um, the, the one thing that I did like with this one was the, the production design. It felt very, uh, the, the place that he goes, like the Bureau of the Lost or whatever it's called is, feels very kind of like Gilliam esque in its design where it feels very Mm -hmm. dark and dirty and cluttered, but it also this like little twinge of like kind of sci-fi where there's like tubes and machines everywhere and wires and stuff. So what you have here is, uh, Marshall discovers that his dad lost his briefcase that has this like really important, uh, prototype thing for his work and he's afraid that he's going to get fired and he but then he also just figures out that there's like kind of something weird happening where people are like just losing stuff at i i guess a accelerated pace so him and simon try to like set up these traps and what he does is um uh, they they decide like okay what what do people lose a lot and the answer is luggage and so marshall decides to hide himself in a trunk and get lost quote unquote Mm. and he ends up in this like secret uh underground like the the bureau of the lost which is like this kind of um bureaucratic uh organization that uh takes stuff Mm. so that people can buy more stuff. So like, I guess it's like this kind of statement on capitalism. I think that's a good reading. I could also see people wanted to, I don't know, read it as complaining about big government or something <laughs> that there's a department dedicated to losing things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, I, I uh, that's that the great the, thing. The there's whole, so many readings. <laughs> I think the whole like bureaucracy okay. of that, does play a part Mm. but the fact that he says like that they exist Mm. just so that the 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 wheels of capitalism can keep turning basically and that and that people continue to consume and spend money uh he's like well what if i didn't take his briefcase then he'd have that that he'd have that briefcase for many years you know he wouldn't be able to buy a new one if i didn't take this one it's it's a very so you know it's it's a it's a fun episode i think it's 
Um, it's a very it's a very interesting reading on uh uh on planned obsolescence almost as a as a yeah yeah allegory it really is and you have um uh his name is escaping me right now it's the guy from it's the Cl- the Klopek from um from the Burbs one of my all time favorite movies ever and he plays like the uh the head the head guy. And you know it's uh, it's fine. I don't really have much to say about this one. I like the production design of the Department of the Lost. Uh, There's definitely some fun stuff in this one. So next is America's scariest home video. I liked this one quite a bit just because it reminded me of of Halloween as a kid. I mean, mm-hmm. t- this one this one is a Halloween episode. It takes place on Halloween. And Simon and Marshall are all excited about going trick or treating. And then they realize that, um, uh, Marshall's mom had to like do something at work or, or, or I can't remember what the reason was, but she had to leave. And she had, uh, she, she told Marshall and Simon that they needed to watch or babysit Simon's little brother. So they can't go trick or treating. They got to stay home, give out candy, watch the little brother. They go in to make some popcorn in the kitchen and they're watching, they have a scary movie on, on the TV and Marshall sets up his camcorder to record the movie off TV, which right there, anybody who is of a younger generation will not understand (laughs) that, that whole concept that the way that you used to be able to record shows off TV was to connect your camcorder Mm -hmm to the TV and then hit record because those camcorders recorded directly to VHS tapes, <laughs> which is something that I have done in the past, which is just, it's wild that that's how we used to do things. Mm. So, um, they're recording this, this movie, it's a mummy movie and the kid bites down on the remote for the TV and it causes this like weird chain reaction where the camera goes nuts and it ends up sucking the kid into the movie and the, the mummy that was in the movie gets, it's a, it's a swap, it's a swap and the mummy ends up in the real world. Mm. And uh, Marshall and Simon have to get get him back, get him get him swapped back. I don't know if we've if, if this was something that was explored in TV or movies. I mean, I, I know that in Willy Wonka we see that with the TV kid, but I don't know if it was really explored before. Since then, we've seen it a lot. I feel like mm-hmm. a lot of TV and movies kind of play with this concept of being transported into a TV show or a movie. I mean, last action hero did it, Hmm. but, um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like it wasn't a very common trope or or idea in 1991. Hmm. So it felt kind of different. Um, and yeah, I thought it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I, there are some of these episodes where it feels like there's a lot to, talk about uh piece by piece and i think there's still a couple more left in this first half that definitely fit that then there are other ones where it's like yeah it's fine there's there's no episode here that's anything less than at least fine yeah it's not like this one had a lot of deep meanings or anything you could probably you know pull pull some kind of meaning from it about like tv or something but for the most part, it was just a fun little Halloween story. Nothing wrong with that. One of the things that I liked is that they think that it's the mummy mm. that gets transported. So they're all scared. They're like, oh, there's a mummy on the loose. It's going to kill everybody. <laughs> but it's not a mummy. It's the actor who plays the mummy. <laughs> so it, tur- it turns out that it's just a dude who gets transported, which I think is kind of a fun mm. little Twist yeah, it's on the it. difference between like a comparatively, you know, well-worn trope for a horror story, uh, and uh, the eerie Indiana version of it. 
Yeah, exactly. So I, yeah, I, I enjoyed this one. It was pretty fun. W- like way, way, way over use of the dry ice in this one. This one was nuts. <laughs> the, the whole house was like covered in dry ice. It was <laughs> insane. Also, uh, this, this one featured a pre, uh, like a makeout scene with Marshall's parents, which I thought was kind of interesting. And, and just another element that you would never see in any other, like, Saturday morning kids show. That's because it's a Sunday night primetime show. Right. Uh, next up, we have uh, Just Say No to Fun. Now, this is this one was not included in the on the YouTube playlist. Yeah, it goes from five to seven. Yeah, which is weird. I don't know why I, this one's not included. I was initially worried it was going to be some sort of weird right thing, so it wasn't going to be anywhere, but then uh, I think we almost realized at the exact same time, you sent me the link a couple seconds before I almost landed on that exact same page, uh, You, c- it's on Amazon uh, also streaming, yeah, yeah. and it's there. It's Perfectly fine. Yeah, it's free on it. Yeah. It's free with commercials on on Amazon, so you can just watch it on there. It's, I don't know why it's not included. It's weird. the The playlist is in the right order too. Like it, it literally just skips from from uh, five to seven. So I, yeah, I don't know. So this one is about the. There's an eye exam at school. And of course, this is this is another one of these things that like it's drawing from stuff that kids have to go through. It would be kind of funny if instead of the eye exam, it was like a lice check. <laughs> <laughs> like you had to go in to get checked for lice, and that's what it that they put in something in their head that that controlled them or something. But what they have here is an eye eye exam, and they. It's like a crazy nurse who bra- basically brainwashes the kids into being like these kind of zombie kids. Yeah. Like, you know, perfectly well behaved children with no personality. Yeah, this one, this one seems like it's a little one. more along the lines of like a traditional kids show in terms of setting up the conflict and what the antagonist's goal is because. Uh, in contrast to some of the other episodes that are a little bit more abstract about it, she just says her goal is to make people not have fun. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. is her job. And it, and, it, and, it, and it's also it definitely fits the whole kind of kids rule, parents suck, yeah. like grown ups suck, <laughs> like that whole kind of th- that whole kind of attitude you had in the nineties, mm. where there was this like major rally against like adults and authority and that that type of stuff and like i remember there were like so many stories like this like books and stuff like i remember there was like my teacher is an alien and my teacher was a monster and stuff like that just a lot of um a lot of books and movies and media properties that kind of played with the idea of uh, adults being having ulterior motives and and being kind of more malicious than, than what they set yeah. out to, to and, be. And if, I did. Lo- <laughs> I, 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 sorry. No, I was just going to say, and, and the, uh, and, and that belief and that, uh, for a kid that gets, uh, contrasted and, and turned even more anxiety inducing during that, uh, harrowing time as a child, when you see one of your teachers out in public, uh, it's very, well, yeah, I think it's it, a very disorienting also, experience, but the teachers don't want to see you either. I think that you could also look at this, um, just, just on a level of like, just getting, having to get glasses mm-hmm. in school, mm-hmm. like that, that whole experience, because I mean, when, maybe it's different now, but when I was a kid, if you got glasses, you were a nerd. Like, that's just, that's it. <laughs> like all of a sudden. And, and it's sort of, it's sort of like how it's like a perception thing where I, like when I got glasses, I was concerned that people were going to be like calling me a nerd and stuff like that. And, and that I was going to be perceived as one of these like, you know, goody goody kids that are represented in this, in this episode because they all get glasses 
And as soon as they get the glasses, then they turn into the like, you know, zombie, the uh, zombie teacher's pets. So I, I think that that yeah. is a factor with this episode as well. Mm-hmm. Good episode overall. I liked, I liked the, uh, there's a little bit of like stop motion going on with this one with the, uh, eye test, eye tester thing. And I thought that that was kind of cool. A, it's an interesting, uh, interesting effect. Um, sort of reminded me of, I would be remiss not to mention this, uh, the, uh, opening title sequence to the show. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. I just want to make sure that I pointed it out. I, it's, it's, it's a good, yeah. it's a good oh, opening yeah. title sequence. Oh yeah. Yeah, so that is just say no to fun. Basically, what happens is uh, Marshall, of course, uh, S- Simon goes in and he gets the brainwashing. Marshall immediately knows something weird is going on, and then he, with the aid of, so there's this like, what's it called? Like the the this the store that they all, that they hang out in. There's this like oh, one yeah. store. It's called like the World of Stuff or something like that, where. It, it's like a, it's a, ha- it's a kid's hangout spot yeah. that they have like I can't quite remember candy. The name, yeah. The flat it's place. It's called like the world. Yeah. I think it's called the world of stuff, but like they, they have like candy and like arcade machines and it's just, it's a hangout spot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they sell all kinds of like weird toys and like joke stuff and magic tricks and all that stuff. And he, so Marshall talks to the owner of that place and, and they uh, <laughs> go through this like sequence of like, it's like breaking out the ultimate like joke item. And it turns out to be like a pair of um, uh, Groucho glasses with the, you know, the nose and the mustache. And when they, they called it like the GM, the GM 20 or something like that, <laughs> which I thought was kind of funny. Yeah. And that's what broke the, the, yeah. the, the, the brainwashing when, when Marshall put that on uh, and Simon saw it's it. Be- it was behind a break glass in case of emergency shield. Yeah. <laughs> it, did, it did introduce the, the, the fact that Simon uh, cannot fake laugh at all. Like, mm. the, the, the laughing that that actor did was horrible. Um, but either way, that's basically what happens. He he deprogrammed Marshall deprogrammed Simon, but then he gets reprogrammed and almost derails the whole plan, but then they uh they pull it together in the end and save everybody. It's funny how like the these two kids like are just constantly saving the town and people's lives and like they they, they get like no recognition for it. <laughs> like even after all of this, you know, we're already six adventures into this and they like done nobody so recognizes them <laughs> yeah nobody recognizes them as like heroes the next one is hard on a chain this one is uh also directed by joe dante this one is is kind of interesting because it, it deals with death yes. and and it, that this is definitely not a topic that gets uh discussed very much in kids shows you know m- mortality sort of obviously has to linger over all the eerie indiana but this is an episode that deals with it more directly as a matter of fact for what the episode's about yeah and i i think i mean props to them for going there with it i think that it's very that this is a very interesting episode you have um this this new kid who starts Marshall becomes friends with him. His name's Devin. And he's like this really cool, really cool, uh, cool dude. And then you have this new girl who starts named Melanie played by Danielle Harris. And er, like uh, both Devin and Marshall kind of like fall for this girl. But it turns out that she needs a heart transplant. She's very, she's, she's ill. Her heart is failing. Uh, Devin, who's this like cool skater dude, um, gets in a, a horrific accident. He gets hit by a truck Mm -hmm. and dies Mm -hmm. and the heart, it, it, I guess he was an organ donor. Uh, his heart is given to the Melanie and she gets Devin's heart. And as a result, 
her personality starts to change and she sort of like starts acting like Devin. Mm. And it's just a, it's a really interesting episode. I, I found this one to be very interesting just on a kid show. Yeah. Level. Like yeah. the fact, the fact that they, it's not like it's a, it's not like it's a, a gruesome, no, like, even though it says in the description, he, he dies in a gruesome accident. I don't know. Like, it's not, I wouldn't say that that's gruesome I mean, necessarily, like but yeah, I mean, is there a non gruesome way to get run over by a truck? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. that's, that's true. true. I mean, it's, they don't show, no. they don't really, sh- they don't show anything, but it is. Yeah. It's just kind of interesting because, because Marshall is, you know, he likes Melanie. He's upset. He's very sad at, that, that he lost his friend, Devin. Melanie sad too, because it was like, it was a love triangle situation. And, um, every time Marshall starts to get close, Devin sort of gets involved and like, I don't know what he does. Squeezes her heart or something like makes her heart stop. It's it's actually pretty concerning. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And it's like, cause at first I'm like, what's he going to do? He's going to do this for like every relationship she gets in for the rest of her life. He's going to just stop her heart. Like that's pretty brutal. Uh, this is actually in a strange way, a, uh, interesting, I don't know, mirror image for lack of a better term, term of an episode that we'll be discussing shortly (laughs) in theme and content. Very much. Yeah. The, so you never really know. You never really know for sure that it's actually Devin. I mean, you don't see like his ghost doing anything or or, or anything like that. Yeah. I think it's very heavily implied. And especially at the end when they show the tombstone with the little angel that cries, which felt weird to me, like felt a little bit out of place. Like, I don't know why it would be crying when it seemed like a pretty happy, like conclusion, but whatever. So, yeah, that one, definitely one of the heavier episodes. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's... More child it, death it, But, there. yeah, it's, it, it's interesting. There are different ways that the show approaches kind of that twist into the surreal or the supernatural. Uh, but all of them, I think what makes the show good is that it has 24 minutes an episode, but it always has this very precise way of just like taking it and just periodically turning the, uh, turning it a little bit more into where, into the, into the surreal and the supernatural and the sinister, uh, by just starting from that, like even handed, like, you know, point to take people, uh, and to take target audience in and then just slowly turning the dial. And I think there's something uh, interesting about how it's still maintaining that structure, but it's coming at it, in different ways, episode to episode. Yeah. And I, and I think that, yeah, I think you make a good point here. And also they do that a lot where y- they give you the, the, the basic premise and then they twist it a little bit more. Mm-hmm. So like when you, when you're watching this episode, the, this, the, the part when Devin gets killed and you find out that Melanie gets his heart it feels like it's the end. Like you, you, it makes you feel like that's the twist. Like, Oh, Mm -hmm. you know, Melanie got his heart, but then it keeps going. And then it, and then it gets into the whole, like her attitude changes and she starts acting like Devin. And it's like this whole other layer that gets added on top. Mm -hmm. And they do that a lot with the show where they'll, they'll add additional pieces in even after you think like, okay, it, that, it, that this is it, this is, it's over, mm. which is, I think kind of definitely, definitely an interesting uh, element to the show. Uh, moving on, we have the dead letter and this one is essentially, it, it is kind of the same as hard on a chain. Mm. This is the one with Toby McGuire and he, uh, the, the, the premise of this one is that Marshall finds this old letter and upon finding the letter, it releases the, the ghost 
of this uh, 13 year old boy played by Tobey Maguire. Mm. And this boy was hit by a car and killed. And he wasn't able to, he was meeting up with, I guess who he considered to be like the love of his life. And he wasn't able to deliver this, this letter. So he's been, you know, stuck as a ghost Mm -hmm. ever since then. And Simon and Marshall have to deliver the letter or else Toby McGuire continues to <laughs> haunt them. Yeah. Which one of the weird things about this one is that he like, he's haunting them sort of, but he like casts a spell on Marshall's family where they like, <laughs> lo- where yeah. they like love him, which is really weird. Yeah. There's a, it doesn't feel entirely necessary to where this ends up going. No, no it's, it's just, just very strange to add that. Uh, this one's directed by Tim Hunter, by the way. I thought that this episode was was fine. It didn't really feel like it was treading on new enough ground for me. Like, I, I don't know. I just was like not very impressed with this one this is another episode that i remember just because of the toby Maguire thing but, yeah, it's, yeah it's, I, it's, I don't know i mean we it's very much especially seeing these episodes so close together it's uh it's very much we we've we've been here <laughs> we've been in this territory right. very recently and uh, yeah i mean the the previous episode was a very similar story and the thing is like I think that episode did it way better. Like I thought that that was a far more compelling story than the, than the dead letter where you have Toby Maguire's trip McConnell, mm-hmm. a 13 year old kid that gets hit by a car mm-hmm. in the twenties. Yeah. 1929 spends the next 62 years, uh, waiting for someone to deliver his letter for him. But also the stakes feel significantly lower yes. in this one and the and because all they have to do is deliver a yes. letter like it seems like at first there, there's a little bit of pushback because the lady doesn't believe mm-hmm. them but it's like you just got to deliver the letter mm-hmm. dude like that's i mean it's it's just it feels like it, um, you, they needed they, there needed to be some sort of heightened conflict in this one yeah, it, it does make you wonder if the, if all the other stuff that was thrown into it was just to kind of let the episode spin its wheels a bit. <laughs> I th- I think it yeah. was because yeah, I'm 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 certain that that's what it was. This this one just again, it was fine. Like it was still entertaining, but I think that this was just definitely a lesser a lesser one compared to the others that we um previously discussed. And um, I think it, it was also. This is also um, the second episode that involved uh, a possible love interest for Marshall. He th- did make out with Danielle Harris in that episode. Again, not something that you typically see in kid shows. And then um, in this one, the niece of the the lady. It seemed like there was a like kind of uh, you know something going on there. Some sparks. Well, well, as you said, it, it feels like a kid show that is definitely aimed at a slightly older audience than other kid shows. Um, I did read. Now, there are some other episodes that I remember, uh, like very vividly that that happened later on in the series. However, um, the I did read here on the Wikipedia that for the later episodes, NBC was trying to have them make it more adult and appeal more towards adults. So uh, I'll be curious to see like what yeah, happens that, in the, that, in the later episodes. The I know that there's a character that they add like a regular character later on who I think that they were trying to appeal to more adults, but I don't know if it worked, but yeah, we'll, we'll get to those later. Uh, the next one that we're going to be talking about is the lost hour. This is, uh, this one's a, this one's a quite a good one. Um, it basically, this is kind of like a time. I like anything that kind of messes around with, with time 
And this one does something that's uh, kind of cool. Like I've never seen this. Doesn't I mean it doesn't make sense, but I, I haven't seen this before in anything else. Uh, basically, it's daylight savings time. Indiana doesn't observe daylight savings time. Not it, I didn't look this up. I was going to look. Yeah, it I don't up know to if that's if that, true. Yeah, I don't know if that's true or not. But according to the show, Indiana doesn't observe daylight savings time, and Marshall gets a little pissy about it and decides that he's going to such turn... a weird thing to get upset about. <laughs> I know he's going to turn his, his watch back anyway, as if that's going to do anything, but actually does do something. It ends up transporting him an hour into the past in a different dimension. So he ends up getting sucked into this like alternate reality where it's it th there's like no people in there except for other people who happen to go into this dimension and it turns out that there's been this this missing girl they think that she's a runaway she's been missing for an entire year and it turns out that she's also in this like kind of dimension that's an hour behind everyone else so I was, I was struggling a little bit with the logic of all of this, like yeah. trying to figure out exactly what it meant to be an hour behind. I yeah, the the fact that he's an hour behind, and like no one else is there. It's like so people just don't exist before. That's, I, but they they do say that it's a different dimension too. Yeah, so. what, are, what they I think what they really meant is they just plunged him into a different universe. <laughs> yeah. But th but there's also still a connection to the present because he ends up meeting this milkman who, uh, when you look in the back of the milkman's truck, mm -hmm. it, it like transports you onto the milk carton, like as a lost kid, mm. <laughs> which is, <laughs> it's, this one is definitely out there. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you have this group of uh garbage men sort of that go around and find items that should not be in that timeline and destroy them in order to preserve like the space-time continuum. And so when they find out that Marshall is in this in this like alternate reality or whatever, this past, uh, they, they go after him and they're trying to kill him. And he ends up finding the girl and, uh, work, he works with the, the milkman to get them back. And the way that they get him back is that they have Simon. He talks to Simon through the milk carton and has Simon set his watch back or no, Forward an hour? Yeah. Forward an hour, which like triggers this thing that <laughs> spits him back out into the present. It's a it's a pretty goofy episode. Yeah. yeah. It's 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 interesting. It's it, again, it's one of those where I feel like the concept is pretty strong, but it maybe falls apart even a little faster <laughs> than than the other ones for which I felt that way. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah, is, because, th yeah. This one is directed by Bob Balaban. It's written by Vance DeGeneres, Ellen's brother. Mm. And it, um, the, the, the missing girl is, is played by Nikki Cox. So, uh, I, I, I can, I, I just, I've done some research on Indiana and daylight saving time. <laughs> If you're wondering, I am wondering. Uh, it was it was observed in parts of it, for some reason the state was is is or maybe was or maybe still is split between central and eastern time, and uh, parts of the state had it and parts of it didn't uh, have uh, DST, and then it was not adopted statewide until 2006. Ah, okay. So in 1991, it would seem that they yeah at least where they were, we're not observing it. Although the dad says it's the whole state. So he's eh. wrong. Loser. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, they're new to the state. They don't know. Yeah. yeah he doesn't know. 
<laughs> also, he's got like all kinds of weird inventions. Yeah, there's a lot going on for him. I, I guess he's not he's not researching this. <laughs> so, um, what did you think of this episode? Did you like this one? Like I said, oh, I, I liked. Sorry, there's an. Go ahead. I'll. There's a another huge thing that happens in this, but I'll no, no. It. I was just saying, I, I liked, I like the concept, but I don't think it, it exactly uh, worked out in a way that I uh, felt was as strong. It's it's just one of those where they're always giving interesting concepts, but sometimes they just can't budget it succinctly in twenty four minutes. Yeah, I mean, it, like there there just wasn't anything really consequential with this one. Like yeah. there wasn't. It, it, there just wasn't really anything that compelling going on. There was the, I mean, the whole angle with the missing girl, I think was interesting. Mm -hmm. And I, I, but I like, I don't know what that's saying, but one of the weird things about this one is that at the end, Marshall finds out that the milkman that's been helping him is him in, in, 90 years <laughs> so he finds out that this guy who's been helping him is the 103 year old version of himself and the reason for that is completely unknown like there's no like it makes no sense like why he's there i don't I, like i don't get that at all hmm I don't know what what Bob yeah. Balaban was was getting at with that or Vance <laughs> DeGeneres, but yeah. very strange that again, one. Again, again in that in that feeling that there are these great ideas that that just get peppered through these episodes, but I just think that the time and the format don't always allow for it. Yeah, maybe there. Yeah, maybe there was something more there. Or maybe they were gonna revisit that later or something. I don't know. Who knows? Might have been something really deep that we just completely missed. Uh, the final, the final episode that we're going to be talking about this month was the broken record. This is directed by Todd Holland. This was the, the last episode. And I think that this one is quite, is quite good too. This is another one that I think is dealing with topics that are not seen very much. It's dealing with topics very head on too. Mm -hmm. that are just not seen very much in this in this format. Yeah, it's, the it, if there's also the um sliding scale for Erie and Diana between uh abstract messaging and more direct messaging, this one is on the very direct end of it. Yeah, yeah. What you have here is uh that uh, this 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 kid named Todd who is a friend of Marshall and Simon's is he he's he's very he's like a kind of nerdy kid he's not very popular he's very soft spoken um and they are hanging out with him one day and they they're in like a music shop and they find this this band that they that they really like called uh I keep wanting to say butthole surfers because that's clearly yeah. who it's in reference to what did what they what what are they calling up it's so, it's something surfers yeah, that's that was the and it sort of feels like a an off rhyme. Yeah, it's definitely shoot, I cannot remember the name of I'm the looking, band. Maybe it's there. But yeah, basically like butthole surfers. And they play the record. This kid this kid Todd, not familiar with the band, he doesn't know anything about it. They go to his house, play the record for him, and it's like it's like a revelation for this kid. It is like a whole new world has opened up for him. He pitbull he, surfers, pitbull surfers. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. Definitely a, a play on on butthole surfers there. But um, he it, like he immediately relates to the lyrics. And by the way, the music's horrible. Like, yeah, that, that, that the pitbull like surfers a, are horrible. That's a terrific <laughs> small detail for this episode. <laughs> This this it's a this terrible was, terrible yeah, band. <laughs> this was shot this was shot in 1991 and the music that they're listening to is like the most generic like 80s hair metal band. It's so bad. Uh but this kid is just in love and his dad ends up like busting in and being verbally abusive frankly to to the son. 
calling him like stupid and stuff like that in front of his friends, no less. And of course, Simon and Marshall are like, okay, we're, we're going to go ahead and we're going to go ahead and leave and we're going to go home. And then like the next day, Todd shows up to their, their little hangout and he's like all punked out. Like he looks like mm-hmm. a, he's a completely different person. Literally. <laughs> overnight. Yeah. yeah. And it, the, he's he's still like having constant problems with his dad. Things are escalating. His dad's becoming more verbally abusive. Doesn't like outright hit him or anything, but like you can kind of see that like things are heading that direction. Mm. I think that maybe that that would have been going to, uh, a little too far on for the show, but it seems like they were getting as close to that as they could. And it turned out that like, it was one of those situations where like you play the record backwards and like, you know, it has, there's like satanic messaging or whatever that dumb rumor was during the satanic panic. Um, and the twist here is that when you play the record backwards, it is literally his dad saying the exact things about the music that he was saying when he was being verbally abusive before. Which is a pretty cool twist, I think. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's sort of the opposite of what I'd been describing earlier, where there was a lot of build-up to, um, to something that didn't really work. I think the payoff here works, but there's not a lot of build-up to it. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. But, I, I mean, like I said, every episode on, on this, there's no bad episode of this I've seen. No, no, there's yeah. not. I yeah, mean, I just think it's, yeah, it's a show that that's struggling with how, with the number of places it can go with its ideas within the time frame, and that manifests itself in different ways sometimes when it does have trouble. Yeah, I feel like, you know, there's there's certain limitations that they were working within. I think that it, it's, a, it's a, a, fine, a very fine line that they were trying to balance on. It's a weird show, like tonally, because it's not, it's somewhere in between being like just a straight up kid show and being uh, for like young adults. And so, and, and also, I think that they were kind of hamstrung by the format, you know, like some of these stories, I would argue that the broken record is one that could have had you know, 45 minutes of content and had that, um, you know, that, that climax be developed a little bit more and explored a little bit deeper than just them simply playing it and then seeing the dad, like basically have a mental breakdown Mm -hmm. over it because that's because the broken record is a very heavy episode when you think about it, because this guy is so horrible. And then at the end, Marshall who, by the way, he, he narrates all the episodes, which I don't really have a problem with because it's usually at the beginning and, and at the end. And mm-hmm. like the narration's not too bad. That's normally something that bothers me more specifically in movies, but TV shows, it also bothers me. Not so much in this one. No, I, because I it's, it's also, I think, it's fine I think that there, there's also like a kind of a wraparound um, thing here where like he's writing like a journal and like keeping evidence of, all of the weirdness and stuff. So it, it makes sense narratively speaking as well. But anyway, at the end of this one, when the dad discovers that like he was the one being manipulated, um, Marshall says that he feels bad for the dad too. And I thought that that was like a pretty poignant moment in, in the show um, or in this episode specifically. So, yeah, it's a it's a pretty great show. I think it is, it's like definitely something unique and I think that it is absolutely worth checking out. I'm I'm excited to check out the the second half. And I'm also I'm not excited, but I'm a little bit curious to see what Fox did with that other that other series. I can't even yeah. remember. It's, it's called Erie, Indiana. Like, and then there's a, the, like a, a subtitle, like, the, oh, the other dimension, the other dimension. Yeah. yeah. 
Eerie Indiana, The Other Dimension. It's 15 uh, so, episodes of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're not going to, we're yeah. likely not, not going to watch them all. Because I, I, I have a strong feeling that it's going to suck. I, I, if it's good, yeah. if it's good, I'll watch more. But something <laughs> tells me that it's, it's going to, th- they're not going to understand what made the original series different and good. Mm-hmm. It it's just gonna be like a like a goosebumps rip off or something like that. Mm. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Stay tuned for that. Yeah, I'm I'm excited Any- to see where the rest of the show goes. Anything else you want to add about uh, this 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 first half before we close it out? I like it so far. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> yeah, and also let us know if you like these types of episodes because we can definitely do this again. There are other shows that I would like to do like more kind of retrospective episodes on. So mm-hmm. you know. yeah, it's, it's always fun to, to try something. Yeah. I mean like doing, yeah. mov- doing movies is fun, but I also like to deviate from that as well and, and mm-hmm. talk about some of these uh, lesser known TV shows and stuff mm-hmm. like the, the, what you call it? The, the Sofia Coppola one. I had a absolute blast diving yeah, into that. That, that. That was a really, that was a really fun episode. All right. Well, I think that that'll do it for this month. Thank you so much for listening. You can send us your nineties topics to nineties at filmpulse.net or by sending us a DM on Twitter or Facebook at nineties pod. If you could also consider reviewing us on iTunes, that would be very helpful until next month for Ken Bakley. My name's Adam Patterson, and this has been saved by the nineties. Bye everyone.